Here we go. We're reading the, the final chapters of Lucy Gayhart. This is book three, chapter one. One winter afternoon, 25 years after Lucy Gayhart's death, the good people of Haverford met at the burying ground for another funeral. Mr. Gayhart's body had been sent home from the hospital in Chicago where he had gone for an operation. It was four o'clock in the afternoon, an unusual hour for a funeral, but the hour had been determined by the arrival of the railway train. The coffin was taken from the express car to the Lutheran church in an automobile hearse. These are modern times, 1927. And after a short service, it was brought to the graveyard. Scarcely anyone could remember so large a funeral Old Mr. Gatehart, as he had been called for years now, had many friends. Since Pauline's death five years ago, he had gone on living in his own house with one of the tailor's daughters as his housekeeper. He had kept a shop open and he continued to practice a little on his clarinet, though he complained that his wind was failing him. On Sundays in summer, he sometimes practiced out in the old orchard, which had never been cut down. He had lived a long and useful life, people were thinking as they walked or drove slowly in their cars out to the cemetery. Almost every time peace in Haverford was indebted to him for some attention. He was slow to be sure, but to the end, he was a good workman. Last night, when they wound their watches, many a one of his old customers paused and wondered. Tick, tick. The little thing in his hand was measuring time as smartly as before, and old Mr. Gayhart was out of the measurement altogether. By four o'clock, the graveyard was black with automobiles and people. The cars formed a half circle at some distance away and their occupants, except the old and feeble, got out and stood around the open grave. The gray-haired businessmen had once been band boys. The young men had taken lessons from Mr. Gayhart even after he stopped leading the town band. His older pupils looked serious and dejected. How many memories of their youth went back to the music teacher who had lived so long and lived happily in spite of misfortunes. It was sad too, to see the last member of a family go out, to see a chapter closed and a once familiar name on the way to be forgotten. There they were, the Gayhearts, in that little square of ground the new grave standing open. Mr. Gayhart would lie between his long dead wife and his daughter, Lucy. The young people could not remember her at all. Pauline, they remembered. She lay on Lucy's left. There were two little mounds in the lot, sons who died in childhood, it was said, and now the story was finished, no grandchildren, complete oblivion. While the prayers were being read, someone whispered that it was almost as if Lucy's grave had been opened. The service brought back vividly that winter day long ago when she had been laid to rest here, so young, so lovely, and everyone vaguely knew, so unhappy. It was like a bird being shot down when it rises in its morning flight toward the sun. The townspeople remembered that as the saddest funeral they had ever drawn old and young together in this cemetery. By the time the grave was filled in and the flowers were heaped over it, the sun had set and a low streak of red fire burned along the edge of the prairie. The crusted snow in the open fields turned rose color. The automobiles began slowly to back out and the people who had come on foot turned their steps homeward. In the company walking toward the town, one man withdrew from the slow moving crowd. 
Forsaking the road, he struck off alone across a fenced pasture, a tall man of solid frame, walking deliberately, his hands in his pockets of his overcoat, his head erect, his shoulders straight. To a stranger, he would have given an impression of loneliness and strength, tried and seasoned strength. He has need of it, for he has much to bear. End of chapter one, book three. Lucy Gayhart, Book Three, Chapter Two. Harry Gordon went directly from the cemetery to his bank and called up his house by telephone. The maid answered. Would she tell Mrs. Gordon that he must finish up some business he had laid aside to go to the funeral? He would have supper sent in from the hotel and would not be home until late. This done, he went through a hallway to his private office. The first Gordon Bank in Haverford was a wooden building. When the brick bank was built, Harry's father had the old building pushed back to the rear and for years used it as a storehouse. Harry, after his marriage, had fitted it with a study and private office. At first, it had looked like any country lawyer's office, oak tables, shelves, that held old ledgers and financial reports. Gradually, almost stealthily, he had made it more comfortable. And as the years went on, he spent more and more time there. The room was heated by the bank furnace, but he had put in a fireplace where he burned coke when the steam got low after banking hours. This evening when he came in, Gordon lit a fire before he took off his overcoat. He unlocked a cupboard, got out his whiskey and a siphon of soda, and sat down by the fire. Pouring himself a drink, he swallowed it slowly. Then he lit a cigar and with a long sigh, settled deep into his chair. His well-set, vigorous frame relaxed. As he lay against the leather cushions, he looked tired tired and beaten. He had just buried the last close personal friend he had in the world. He was not, he thought with a grim smile, likely to make new ones at 55. How differently life had turned out from the life young Harry Gordon planned in the days when he used to step out on the diamond to pitch his famous in curve with all the boys and girls calling to him from the bleachers. For the last eight years, he had played chess with old Mr. Gayhart two or three evenings every week. He had become a good chess player, quite Gayhart's equal. After Pauline's death left the old man alone, Gordon managed to drop into his shop every day, if only for a moment. Chess had become one of his fixed habits. They played in Gayhart's shop, never at the house. They talked no more than good chess players usually do. Gordon had watched games between players of international renown when he was abroad during the war, and Mr. Gayhart liked to hear him tell of them over and over. Like many other men whose lives were dull or empty, Harry Gordon threw himself, as the phrase went, enthusiastically into war work, Red Cross, food conservation. Finally, he went over himself with an ambulance unit, which he had helped to finance. He was gone for eight months, and his wife took his place as president of the bank and manager of all of his business interests. That was probably the happiest period of her life. She was a born woman of affairs. For Gordon himself, that absence did a great deal. Ever since he came back, the townspeople had felt a change in him. His friendship with old Mr. Gayhart grew closer and warmer, like a son's regard, indeed. At home, he played his part better. He and his wife seemed more companionable, went out together, had guests to dinner. 
The air in their big, slippery-floored, many-bathroomed house was not so chill as it used to be. And in business, Gordon was more consistent. For some years before he went away, he had brought on himself a reputation for eccentricity. This had gone so far as to affect his credit. At one time, he would be sharp and tricky, barely keeping inside the law. At another, he would let everything go, as if he felt a contempt for his business and were shuffling it off in the easiest way. Conservative men had begun to doubt his judgment. Since his return from France, he had devoted himself seriously to the bank, as his father had done, and he became more like his father. You knew where to find him now, Milton Chase said. There had been a stretch of time back there when Gordon's erratic decisions wore his cashier thin and bald. Milton Chase probably knew more about his chief than anyone else did, but he didn't pretend to understand him. He had found it very agreeable to work under Mrs. Gordon. She was a reasonable woman. When he gave her the facts about any proposition that came up, he could pretty well tell in advance what she would think about it. But Harry had sprung too many surprises on him. On the surface, there was perfect accord between Gordon and his cashier, but deep down, Milton was chafed by a secret distrust. What was he to think when one of the most self-centered of men began to give not only his time, but his money to the Red Cross? And worse was to follow. On the morning when Harry called Milton into the room behind the bank and told him that he was going to France with the hospital unit, the cashier went to pieces and said he didn't know whether he could face his responsibility. He'd have to take a few days off and think it over. In the course of the years, queer things had happened which Milton could never explain. Things which were out of order, which ought not to occur in business. For instance, a shocking scene had come about when they were foreclosing on Nick Wakefield. Nick had been one of the gay young fellows who used to play about with Lucy Gayhart. He inherited a big farm from his father, but he was a town boy, didn't like heavy work, and he failed as a farmer. When the bank was shutting down on him, Nick nerved himself with plenty of alcohol and came in to have it out with Harry Gordon. The game was up and he might as well have his say. It was a very unseemly thing to occur in a bank. Nick was full of bitter talk. He made several ugly accusations, more or less true, and ended with a taunt which brought the cold sweat out on Milton's brow as he sat trying to look small in his cage. You're ready to hit a man when he's down, Nick shouted, clenching his fist and standing up to Harry. But you're a damned coward for all your big chest. Afraid to go to poor Lucy Gayhart's funeral, weren't you, big man? Beat it for Denver. I guess there was a reason, all right. Milton had expected the ceiling to fall. He prayed that it might. But what happened was stranger. Gordon made figures on his desk pad for a moment. Then he turned in his chair and looked at Nick. He spoke to him in a voice that was really kind without any contemptuous jollying in it. There are some names I wouldn't mention in your state of health, Nick. You're loaded and you'll be sorry for this tomorrow. Come in then and finish what you have to say to me. The bank sold Nick Wakefield out, but in terms more lenient than Milton Chase thought proper. End of chapter two, book three, Lucy Gayhart.